You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Good Question Podcast. Uh, My guest today is Eric Recker. He's the founder of what's called Win the Now. He teaches uh, leaders how to uh, achieve more and win the now. Our website is ericrecker.com. That's E-R-I-C-R-E-C-K-E-R.com. Welcome, Eric. Thanks for having me, Richard. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, tell me a bit about uh, your background. and Let's go into what does win the now mean once you get there. Yeah, so I have a history of some bullying when I was growing up. And for me, on the recess kickball fields of Iowa in the early 80s, recess kickball was life. That was the big deal. And I was told that I wasn't good enough to play. And I wasn't just told that once. And it wasn't like I was picked last. I could have handled that. But I was told that I wasn't good enough. And when you hear that enough, then you start to believe that maybe it's true. And so I remember in third grade making a pact with myself that I was going to be so freaking good at everything that I ever did that no one would ever not pick me. Now that I look back on that, really, I've only got come to grips with that over the last few years. But really, that was a recipe for what led to burnout because nothing was ever good enough. And I had chased a whole lot of things in my career, actually found myself in a season of burnout where I was having heart palpitations, chest pain. I was having panic attacks and it led me to almost selling my dental practice and walking away in early 2021. And then when uh, a tragic occurrence happened that beat it so I couldn't do that, I had to step back and figure out what I really wanted my life to look like because I was trying to take this burnout and I was trying to go around it. When in reality, what I really needed to do was go through it. And I needed to figure out how to do that. And when the now is actually a concept that I developed during that time of trying to figure out what I wanted to do, because I found that myself and I have found many, many, many people that I've had conversations with, we tend to be stuck in the past with the things that happened to us, our regrets, the different things that have happened to us. Or we're worried about the future, the things that haven't happened yet that we're worried about, stressed about, fearful about. And what we miss out on is the now. That's the moment right in front of us. And that's where the magic happens. And that's the most important thing is what's right in front of us. What does that mean? Like you're you're trying to cultivate presence awareness or you know, what what does that mean now that now is the most important part? What do you do about it? Yeah, absolutely. So I call win the now the mindset of presence. So it's figuring out what are the now moments in your life. So for us right now, the now is this conversation. And then, so we take that, we have this time that we're having this conversation. And what does a win look like in that moment? So a win looks like a great conversation between the two of us. A win looks like great value for the listeners. A win looks like somebody walking away from this and saying, wow, I could really use that in my life. And then you break down the different parts of your life into the different now moments and what do wins look like in those moments. And it's a way to keep us in the present moment. What does that mean and what a win looks like? And I don't understand. Like, what's an example? Yeah. So I'll start with my dental practice. So I, I'm a dentist by trade, uh, as I said before. So I break my day into, so before I start work, I have a meeting with my partner and then another meeting with my team. So what does a win look like in those moments? Uh, A win looks like my partner and I having a good conversation about the things that are going to, that we need to talk about. A win for our team meeting is something like we're all set up well for the day. People share the things that are on their minds, the concerns about their schedule. And then when I get into my day, I look at every 15 minute as a now moment. So a win might look like myself and a patient having a great conversation. I might help somebody with an anxiety that they have over the dental procedure that we're going to do. 
there are going to be times when we take losses. Uh, sometimes anesthetic's not a perfect science. Uh, sometimes somebody's not going to get numb and we have to work through that. And we just ask one question of those moments when we take a loss. What can I learn from that loss? And then we move forward because there's another now moment that we want to be in and we want to try to grab a win. So what are the, some of the things that happen in people's mind? Like what kind of, uh, you just classify it as distractions or, you know, uh, your mental state, uh, controlling your mental state. Like how, how do you, you know, what blocks people from being in the now? Yeah, our phones are certainly one thing to block us from being in the now. It's really easy to be in a meeting and we're paying attention fine. And then all of a sudden we have that uh, that little urge to pick up our phone. And all of a sudden we're in la-la land uh, and we're zoned out. Uh, we all have to-do lists. And those to-do lists can run around in our mind. They're things we have to do in the future but we're constantly thinking about that. So we're not in the present moment. So we're not at the, uh, at the dinner table with our family. We're there in our body, but we're thinking about either what happened at work or what we have to do tomorrow at work. And it's weird game that we're never in the same place. We can be never in the same place, mind and body, because if we're in one place, we're thinking about another place. Hmm. How does the book work? It makes you aware of the importance of now and it gives you a guideline at the be in the present moment? Or like, what is the book about? Yeah, so the first book I wrote is actually called The False Sense of Urgency and How to Win the Now. So The False Sense of Urgency, I described that as a background app that we have running in the back of our minds constantly. And like we have apps on our phones that are running in the background and sucking power and doing all the things that they do. This is kind of something that's constantly going in the back of our mind. And it keeps us from the present moment. It's uh, one of the most common words for the false sense of urgency that it gives us is the word should. It's a Sunday afternoon. You don't have a lot on the calendar. It would be a good time to rest and relax before you get ready for the next week. But instead, the word should comes up. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. You should not be resting. There's so much to do. You can't relax. You can't take your foot off the pedal. There's emails. There's all of these things that you need to do. And living in the present moment is one way to kind of shut off that false sense of urgency. Hmm. Well, again, I don't know if people understand how to live in the present moment. Do they have to turn, turn off notifications on their phone? You know, or ha What habits in their life do they need to change to be able to be in the present moment? Yeah. So one of the things I, I think phones are a huge distractor for us. So one of the questions that I like to ask, because I know that the, my phone pulls me out of the present moment all the time. So I ask myself, why am I picking this up? That's one of the big things that I try to always ask myself, because I know if you're anything like me, you have a phone routine. I pick up my phone and I probably look at email. I might look at the weather. I might look at a couple social media sites. I might check some numbers on my website. And then I get done with that. Well, depending on how long that took, I might start in that phone routine one more time and go through everything. So we find ourselves spending all of this time on our phones and that keeps us from the present moment. So I have not perfected this. My mind still wanders like everybody else's. One Another common thing I do is I use a recentering phrase. I write, remind myself, I am here, right here, right now. And this is born from seasons of my life where I just had way too much on my plate and it led to burnout. So I would had a time when I was building a new dental practice. I had just bought the practice from my father. I was coaching both of my kids in soccer. I was on five different boards. I was starting to get a new associate trained at my office, and I was training for two Ironman triathlons. Hmm. That's a crazy amount of stuff to have on your plate. And in that season of my life, I was never in the same place, mind and body. If I was doing one thing, I was thinking about another. If I was doing this, I was thinking about that. And I really struggled during that time because I would just was not in the present moment. Okay. I mean, does it take a lot of effort? To be in the present moment you found or has it become less effortful you know what was it like for you to struggle with this yeah the wonderful thing is that we have neuroplasticity and our brains are able to be trained uh for for new pathways 
once we start to realize the beauty of the present moment and, and how we can be in better relationships with our people, we can have better conversations, uh, we can have more joy. I have a lot more joy when I'm in the present moment than when my mind is in a million different places. If I find my mind is spinning like crazy, sometimes I will just take five minutes and do a brain dump. I'll take everything that's in my mind and I will write it down in my notebook. And just the simple fact of getting it out of there then allows me to come back to the present moment because I'm not trying to organize all those things in my mind. And so over time with some simple strategies, uh, uh, simple, I guess, simple but not easy strategies, I've been able to find myself so much more engaged in the current, in the present moment than I was in the past. So what about the people in your life? Do they notice that you're different? For sure. Yeah. My kids have, it's been a huge difference for my family. I would be sitting at the dinner table and they would just tell me a story and I would get to the end of the story and I didn't have a clue what they just said. I'd be nodding along and I'm sure you can relate to this. We can all relate to these times when we've had conversations with people. And when we're not the one talking, we're taking a commercial break. We're just not in the moment. And I'm much more engaged with my family. And that has made a huge difference in my marriage. It's made a huge difference in my leadership at work, in my relationships with my friends. It's really changed so many things. Has it changed them or just their perception of you? Like, as a, you know, they said, how do you do it? You know, you're different. Like, what what have they said to you? They just said, it's nice to have you around. That's kind of like a, uh, kind of like a knife to the chest, to be honest with it's, I'm glad that they're happy with the way I am now, but it also meant that there was a season where, where I wasn't here and they knew it. When we tend to have too much on our plate, we're just always trying to figure out how we can get those things, get all those things done. So we end up with the people who are most important to us, we don't end up spending much quality or quantity of time. Mm. So has it inspired uh, anyone in your family to do the same? What what happens if you're present and you're with someone that's on their phone and they're, uh-huh, uh-huh. they're not listening to you and you can see that they're just completely not there? Like, what do you do now differently versus before? I tell you what, it annoys the heck out of me. Uh, that's been a huge change for me. I never really noticed that my wife did this, but if she was starting to talk to me and I was gone on my phone or gone somewhere else, she would just pause. Me. And I tell you what, I, I do that now with people. If they're having a conversation with me and looking down at their phone and they're just kind of, you know, doing the nodding thing as if they're paying any lick of attention, I'll just stop talking. Oh, and then what happens usually? Do they realize so they just... I go for like multiple seconds while they just tap away and they don't even realize. Yeah. Yeah. That'll happen to be, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said, no, it's okay. Go ahead and finish up whichever, whatever you got to finish up because it's usually something really important. Right. So it's been a fun journey in that sense. It's been um, a great journey with my, uh, with my coaching clients that I've worked with. Uh, just seeing the difference that a few small changes uh, have made in their lives, what their families have noticed, and how a lot of their families have embraced it as well. So how do you train someone to be in the now? Yeah, I th- the biggest thing is to just have awareness of it. The biggest thing is to just, in your mind, go through the different moments of your life and am I fully present in this moment or am I thinking about something else? Am I in another place? So, you know, if we don't have self-awareness, then we can't make a meaningful change. And then we start to think about, okay, what's one thing I can do to get 1% better tomorrow? Okay. uh, Tomorrow at the dinner table, I am going to put my phone on do not disturb. That's one thing I'm going to do tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow work during the meeting, I am going to set something with my emails that says I'm going to be in meetings all day and I'm not going to be able to get back to you. Uh, I'm going to tell my kids that I'm going to go do something with them for a boundary amount of time, whether it be in an hour or a couple hours, and they're going to get all of me during that time. So I think What's dangerous is we can think that we have to make these massive changes immediately. We don't have to. It's just how can I get 1% better at living in the present tomorrow? See how that goes. And then how can I do it again the next day? Because it's 
it's a mountain to climb. It really is. When you've been so distracted for a good period of your life and you want to start living a more present life, that's a big mountain to climb. And once we, and if it always just looks like a mountain, if we're not willing to take a small step onto it, it's always going to be a mountain. But all of those things in our lives that we want to conquer, if we can start really small and just take one step onto the mountain, it becomes smaller with each step. Well, all right. So um, I don't know. Do you feel like you're missing out by doing this? Like, uh, what was the withdra- was there a withdrawal from the way you were doing these before? You know, like what what was the hardest thing about it? Yeah, the hardest thing probably was just realizing what I had been missing out on. That was probably probably the toughest part for me. And I had, yeah, I had some phone withdrawal for sure. And and I still use my phone. It's not like I don't ever use it. I'm just intentional about using. It. What does that look like? Yeah, it means I have to have a reason for picking it up. And so I'm better at not just giving myself free range phones. And we've all done that, right? We've got onto Instagram or a different social media site, and then it shows us a video and it knows what kind of videos we like. I tend to have this thing for fail videos. I don't know what it is about it, but I like watching videos where somebody does something dumb. I just, I just kind of, funny and therapeutic to me, I guess, hey. but I can get on and, and whether it's that or it's dogs or whatever your thing is, you can watch a video and then go flip to the next one. And it's another one and another one and another one and another one. And I was really sick of wasting an hour doing that because when that was done, I didn't feel more peace. I didn't feel more presence. I just felt more anxious and I felt frustrated because I'd wasted an hour. Hmm. Interesting. So um, we mentioned uh, before we get on the call that there's a, is there a new book, a secondary book that you've written now that you want to talk about? Yeah, there is. Uh, and it's called That Damn Analogy, How to Fill Up, Stay Up, and Impact the World. So the basis of that book is that we are like a dam. So what a dam does is it controls the flow of water through it. Most are built for flood control. And the way that we are like a dam is all we are really doing is uh, regulating the flow of energy that goes through us. So we're pretty good at the output side. We're good at getting things done. We're good at doing our tasks, all of those types of things. But we're not very good at the inflow part. We're not very good at self-care. We do a lot of things that self-sabotage us. And so what I found is every time that I was burned out, it was because I was empty. I was pushing too hard. I was doing too many things and I wasn't taking enough time for self-care. So the book is all about identifying the problem, being able to figure out in real time, where are we? What does our tank look like? Are we full? Are we empty? Are we somewhere in between? And then the rest of the book is strategies on how we can avoid being too empty and how we can make sure we are measuring which types of outflows are important and which ones are just draining us. Okay. What what are some examples that maybe people wouldn't even realize stuff that drains their attention? Yeah, absolutely. So A lot of the things that we say yes to, we say yes to out of duty. Some of the things that we have to do, some of the shoulds. And so I talk about people making a list of all the things that they're committed to. And that is not only external commitments, it's internal commitments. So it might be your job and a board that you serve on, some things that you do to volunteer. But it also might be how much you watch Netflix, uh, how much time you spend on a hobby, how much time you spend on your phone, different things like that. And then when you look at all the things that are draining your energy, which of those are good things that are draining your energy? Which of those things fit your greater purpose or your why? And which of those things are things that are just draining you? You know, I I think it is a lot of people think that, okay, it's the weekend. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to binge Netflix. I'm going to eat junk food and I'm, somehow going to be fine on Monday. Mm. You're not going to be fine on Monday. You're going to be anxious. You're not going to be any more filled up than you were when you left. 
And so what are some better things that we can do with our time that actually help our brains to recover from the busyness of our weeks? Okay. So what are some things that people can do that just deliberately take a day off like a Sabbath or within a given day, structure time to just veg out? Right? What are some suggestions? Yeah. I'm a huge fan of a Sabbath. I try to do that on Sundays whenever I can. And it's not, it's not necessarily a complete day. I'd like to take a little bit of time to get ready for the next week. Uh, one thing that's a huge self-care thing for me is planning my next week. I try to time block my week as much as I can. I look at what are the things that need to get done. And on a Sunday afternoon, I take a half hour to 45 minutes and I time block my week. I also try to set myself up for success for the week. So uh, my wife and I will do some meal planning. We'll look at our calendars and say, okay, where where might be some some pinch points or some things that we need to talk about uh, during the week. And then a lot of people think that the only times that they're going to be able to recover, refill, and have time for self-care is when they have vacations. Well, vacations are great, but I don't, and I don't know about you, Richard, but I don't get a whole lot of full week vacations. Yeah, it'll be rare. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of times we come into those vacations coasting on fumes, right? We did so much to get prepared for it. Then we get there and it can take most of the week for us to really uncork and actually enjoy ourselves on the vacation. So my strategies are more, what can I do in the smaller moments of life to help me refill? So I might not have a week for vacation, but I might have a day. So what are some things that, that help refill in the day? Maybe you like to go to the lake for a day or the beach. Maybe you like to go to the mountains and do a hike. Maybe you want to go for a bike ride or an exercise. Okay, no, I don't have a full day. I have half a day. Okay, what can you do on a half a day to make, to help fill up your tank? What can you do? I don't have a half day. What can you do in an hour? What is one thing you can do in an hour? Well, I'd really like to sit and just read a, read one of my favorite books for an hour. Awesome. Mm. Then schedule a time to do that. I don't even have an hour. I have a really busy schedule. Maybe I only have 20 minutes. Okay. Well, maybe during that 20 minutes, you can just sit in the quiet and listen to some of your favorite music. It's all about figuring how we can scale that recovery so that we're doing some of it on a day-by-day and week-by-week basis instead of getting so low and expecting these vacation times that we have to solve our problems. Yeah, that's true. I mean, everyone has you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, something. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that we have lost is that little bit of brain idle space. Our brains really want to rest. They really want to not be stimulated all the time. And it used to be if we would pull up to a stoplight and wait for it to turn green, Maybe we'd have some music on, but we didn't have a lot of other things to do. We'd maybe look around and then just enjoy the scenery or just let our brain not just wander with thoughts. Now right. we can pick up our phone or try to be busy doing something. Same thing within that when we were in the grocery store, when we would wait in line, we would just have some of that quiet space for our brain. And we've taken so much of that away. So how can we incorporate small amounts of quiet back into our lives? Because our brain craves that. Hmm. Makes sense. Is this uh, is the new plan and the old plan just books? Do you have coaching that goes with it? Uh, you know, videos? Like, what does it look like for someone that's listening and says, you know, man, I'm distracted all the time. I can't think, nothing, and I want to get my focus back. What, what's your uh, recommendation? Yeah, so books are both uh, a great place to start. One of the things that I really like to do is uh, I work with companies on the damn analogy workshop. So I come in for either two or three hours and we go through a bunch of these concepts and it is really a great way for, I have one coming up next week actually, and I'm going to this company and they're they're struggling with some of these th- same things. They have people who are burned out and they're frustrated and they're just trying to get more focused at work. And so we go through these concepts and it's in a workshop format so that people actually get a chance to share what's going on in their lives and work together for solutions of, you know, how can I refill better? This is what I'm struggling with. What can we do about it? 
And it really is, it's amazing the transformation that I've seen in some of these cultures just through people being able to be honest about where they're at and have some accountability for moving forward. Okay. So um, how can people get in touch with you to get help and, uh, you know, to get this training? Should they read the books first? Should they reach out to you first? What's your recommendation? Yeah, whatever works best. I would say reading that damn analogy is a great start. You can certainly follow me uh, on social media, home base, my website, ericrecker.com, as you mentioned. And if people are feeling burned out or struggling with presence and how to be in the present moment, I have a couple of freebies that I like to give out. One is a five-day knockback burnout challenge, uh, and that's available on my website. And another thing I have is five principles of win the now. And it's five basic things that you can do to try to live more in the present moment. Hmm. Okay. Then go to ericrecker.com and that's, that's probably the best way to start. It sounds like. Absolutely. That's a great place to start. Okay. Well, very good. I, I really appreciate you coming on. And, um, I mean, what you're doing is needed because everyone's uh, distracted and you know, I try to cultivate focus. I don't even use social media very much. I have it used for me, but still. You know, I find myself distracted or there's a book I want to read and I'm like, oh, it's just easier to look at the phone and then I don't read the book. And so it's a big problem. I can see it everywhere. Yeah, for sure. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at thegoodquestionpodcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit thegoodquestionpodcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 